Chairman Chambers, Board of Trustees, August faculty and staff, fellow distinguished honorees, the Annandale community, and the graduating class of 2021. <clears throat> what, what an overwhelming honor to join you in celebration and to join you in person. President Botstein, thank you, President Botstein, for that too generous an introduction. Thank you for the gifts of your scholarship and the gifts of your friendship. I've had the distinct pleasure of knowing President Botstein and spending meaningful time with him, but never in his sanctum sanctorum. Even away from campus and without the trappings of ceremony, President Botstein always seems to be wrapped in the garbs of ritual. That effect is greatly enhanced in academic regalia, which you wear quite well, sir. <laughs> Hannah Arendt, whose grave lies near to us here on this campus, described friendship as one of the most active modes of living. Maestro, you embody that in the personal and in the political, and I see that that ethos extends throughout this community. Please be forewarned, Mr. President, that I have this belief that one should never waste the privilege of a public platform, and my inclination is to provoke and interrogate even at a tea party. Furthermore, while one might look for some practical directives from a commencement speaker, I'm oriented towards the impracticalities of the unapprehended poetry in our midst. I hope I won't give you occasion to regret your generous introduction and welcome. Graduates, I have one more confession that I want to make here at the start. The address that I'm delivering now was crafted late last night after I completely rejected the arc of my original draft. Commencement addresses are bracketed by such traditional expectations of exhortative language that one tends to bury the desire to express any sincere sentiments that don't fit neatly in that rubric. There's a liturgical order to these things. I'm supposed to look out upon you, ordain your absolute greatness, acknowledge your brilliance, lift up the example of a great alumnus, and command you to go forth amongst the uncivilized herd to shine your light. I'll, I, you know, if, if I was following the traditional pattern, I would pull down some appropriate quotation from the classic, something like Pindor from the, uh, from the um, uh, Pythian Chronicles. I'd say, oh, my soul, do not aspire to a mortal life, but exhaust the limits of the possible. And I would tell you to then exhaust the limits of the possible. All of this would have the expectation of being punctuated by raucous applause from all of you all. <laughs> there, there, wouldn't be, there wouldn't be much room left for any nagging doubts about your accomplishments or your destinies. Now, while your parents and your loved ones who pay dearly for the privilege can trust that I'll do some version of all of the above, there's a different sensation and focus that quickens my reflections this afternoon. I want to interrogate the very notion of your exceptionalism and the broader question of our national excep exceptionalism at this moment when history is balanced on a knife's edge. Let me start, though, with a note about the ground that we stand on. Contrary to my wariness about praising ex exceptionalism, we could all say an amen to the notion that Bard is a special place. Might I get an amen for that? It is indeed one of the essential spaces for those of us who care about the promotion and the protection of our open society. Graduates, please know this and hold on to that essentiality as you move on from this hamlet. It has been a year of acute struggle and profound isolation as you've, as you've attempted to endeavor to complete your studies during this pandemic season. I know that the siren song of early summer and the confidence that we all have now because we have vaccines in our, whole, in our arms, all of that compels us to get back to the excitement of worshiping the combustion of matter in motion that comprises contemporary civilization. But graduates, be still and know that not all movement is towards meaning. Sit in this place 
in the beatitude of it, be present and imbibe the hard-won lessons of this traumatic year, but also take stock in the permanent ownership of the armature that you've acquired in this special place. Bard is an institution that we all should defend fiercely. When I was asked to take up this honor, I didn't hesitate for one second. First of all, it was because it would give me an opportunity to feel fabulous in flowing robes. But mostly, but mostly, because this is a nexus of thought and action that speaks to my core sense of democracy, justice, inclusion. There are scholars who are joining us today who are graduating through the Bard Prison Initiative, which is one of our great redemption songs in higher education, in a society that imprisons people who look like me at disproportionate astronomical rates. As someone who grew up in financial hardship, I will praise Sing, a college that opens its doors to a student population that is 26% Pell eligible. And I'm awed by students who manage to not only be resourceful enough to conduct scientific research, artistic performances, and scholarly work under the strain of COVID, but also participated in a year-long President's Commission on Racial Equity and Justice. You asked the hard questions. You didn't accept the usual answers. You demanded positive change, and critically, you took up the responsibility for the work that comes with change. This college that has survived on the hustle and the audacity of creative administrators has far outpaced universities with deep endowments uh, uh, on the investments that you all have made on social justice and the building and binding of a more perfect union. And that is deserving of self-applause. <clears throat> Bard, Bard is also essential as an idea because the humanities and not only STEM are vital to remake the world in its broken places. We must learn how to understand and not only how to have impact, to invest in meaning and not only in harnessing resources. We must be guided by the compass of our soul's curiosity aligned with the ballast of our reflective moral equilibrium. These are the bricks and mortar of a barred education and the tent poles for a society that promotes the rights of the most vulnerable. This is clearly why George Soros, the great champion of open societies, saw fit to place an unprecedented big bet on the ideal of Bard. We should all do the same. And now, graduates, can we talk a little bit about you? I have to, you know, I have to admit to being slightly intimidated by the notion that I've been asked to, to frame and define your moment of triumph and to impart some vision as you take the next brash steps in your journey. I feel poorly equipped to do that, mostly owing to the enormous wall that stands between our generations. I like to think of myself who's, as somebody who's still relatively young. Clearly, I have an active imagination. But in truth, I'm three decades older than you all, and I share the same follicle challenge as your esteemed president. <laughs> and I'm on the verge, I'm on the verge of being fatigued by experiences that you don't even have names for yet. But as I consider what I might have to say to you today, I realize that there is some strength and advantage in my infirmities. Now, I've always been one to advise that one should be profoundly suspicious of the agendas and the generosities of the previous generation. But please know that while I might not have an intimacy with your music, your fashion, or with your tech, I do have the ability to look back on the arc of my own journey that I've traveled from the seats that you currently occupy right now to the perch that I have on this podium with this embarrassing notion that titles I've worn uneasily, marbled halls that I've accessed somehow, grant me some bizarre exceptionalism that compels you to have to suffer through my poor musings. But oddly, my confidence in our kinship grows, grows, as I realize, with apologies to all of your loved ones and these extraordinary educators, how spectacularly ordinary we all are. Yes, I said ordinary. 
I know it's customary to extol your genius on a day like today, but ultimately, the diploma that you're going to receive on this stage does little to distinguish you between the nearly 117 billion homo sapiens who have devoured oxygen before you. Heck, there are four million students who are receiving some form of college diplomas in the United States this year alone. All of our beauty, essentialists, all of our genius was all greatly exaggerated. This is true of us all. Well, perhaps with the exception of your honorary recipient, Audra McDonald, who is as brilliant and as genius as advertised. <laughs> there are ways, though, there are ways, though, that you may yet elevate your soul's highest song and the greatness that your, fa your family has aspired to for you. But I'll get there momentarily. In many ways, I'm still very much the person that I, that I was when I reached your mark. But there are ways that life alters you far beyond your ability to even recognize yourself. I had an Odyssean greed for experience that was set against the very real limitations of economic degradations and the lived challenges of institutionalized racial animus. Those impositions stirred in me an anger that could have been dangerously self-destructive. My salvation came in the form of involvement in movements far greater than myself that pulled down my vanities and channeled whatever few gifts I had. I learned in my wilderness journey what President Barack Obama articulated with such precision that, quote, thinking about yourself, fulfilling your immediate wants and needs betrays a poverty of ambition. This poverty of ambition, an all-consuming certitude about the significance of one's own navel, extends from the individual to the nation state, to this nation state. I've been involved in work of politics my entire life, from solidarity work in my Haitian American diaspora community, to my true awakening in the anti-apartheid era, to my work as an organizer for low-wage workers, to my uh, efforts in electoral politics, which culminated in my service in the White House, my foray into diplomacy and international advocacy through philanthropy. You might say that I've been in the business of history, and I've done it with a religiosity, a faith in functional cooperative behaviors and structures that enable us all to impose our will on history for progressive outcomes. The central notion in my unpacking of it is that history is in all of what we keep, what we choose to preserve, what is in the service of a coherent humanitarianism, and in what advances justice. As an immigrant who had to carve out his own sense of Americanness, I can appreciate the words of Vaclav Havel who wrote that quote, he tried to hold in a single thought, reality, and justice. There's a struggle in that for those of us who are not part of the orthodoxy, who, are, who sit outside of the tradition of power in this nation, this sense that, tr that justice is a transcendent thing that is ever elusive. Justice has been historically elusive in our nation, and so has truly inclusive representative democracy. I won't here recite our innumerable challenges, and our most recent traumas, though the recent insurrections in our nation's capital and the ensuing lack of national examination reminds us that violence and authoritarianism have more enablers than instigators. I raise this here to extend out my interrogation of exceptionalism, in this case, American exceptionalism, and to wonder aloud what a recasting of America's place in the world might mean for this graduating class, for your generation, both those who are US born and based, and the 10% of your cohort who are international students. We're emerging from a devastating health and economic crisis, greatly exacerbated by the ignorance of ill-equipped leaders who insisted on our exceptionalism in the face of the shocking death tolls, the stunning job loss, and the resulting hunger and deprivations. The, the essential nation, essential America, was exposed as a fragile state, 
despite the resilience, of our, the resilience of our truly essential workers and the deep pockets of wealth. We suffered from that poverty of an, of an ambition and an, an inability to see ourselves in the world and a failure to count up the cost of isolation and American firstism. What might a different ambition look like now? How might we look beyond our own navels? The great writer, Ralph Ellison, was an instructor here at Bard in the late 1950s, a time when surely he must have been one of the few black people on this campus. Ellison wrote that, quote, Americans give but a limited attention to history. Too much happens too rapidly, and before we can evaluate it or exhaust its meaning or its pleasure, there is something new that concerns us. Ours is the tempo of the motion picture, not that of the still camera, and we waste experience. We waste experience. How do we advantage ourselves from the great toll of experiences that we've just had? We must begin with a de-exceptionalization of the self and the nation. America is, of course, an overwhelming planetary force, but we need to help repair the world and protect against future calamities by being one of many players in it. We can and we must tackle the great challenges cooperatively, not through a winner-takes-all race to the bottom. Any diplomat will tell you that confrontation alone mostly fails. For instance, we can appreciate that in order to reinvigorate the human rights global movement while also solving our climate crisis, we need to be able to hold the reality of the injustice endured by the Uyghur community and confront China whilst recognizing the enormity of the scale of carbon emissions while we work in partnership with China. We have to appreciate the singularity of the American experience of systemic racism while reaching for the lessons that we might draw from the resistance to police abuse in the favelas in Rio where there are countless George Floyds every day. What America does best is lead with the capacity for reinvention. Right now, the world needs the spark of that and not the poverty of an ambitious hegemony. I'll conclude by returning to the individual, to you all, and to your exceptional opportunity to be great. Now, coming out of this long quarantine, it's easy to slide into a lazy decade of youthful waste where the health of your generation will be judged by all of what you consume. That would be a poverty of ambition. We need to look up from our navels and look up from our phones and realize at last that the service uh, to others is the only leadership that has legacy. In my pocket, and now placed on this podium, I have this treasured photograph of my father from the 1950s, my late father. He's resplendent in a graduation gown replete with satin flourishes. He matches you in style, President Botstein. In his hand, he's clutching, seemingly for dear life, his law diploma, which he had just received from the finest university in Haiti. The world was very much in front of him with his exceptionalism assured. But even in that moment, this diploma was losing all the value as a brutal dictatorship supported by the United States was taking hold in that proud island nation and dismantling the very concept of justice. He never got to practice his profession. Our, <clears throat> our ideals of peace and justice are ephemeral, fragile things without sustainable institutions like Bard and without servant leadership. My father's degree was printed on stock equal to yours. But what he learned is what you need to learn is that you need to prove the value of that degree every single day, every day. And you do it with service to others. That's a lesson that I've had to learn and to take up many times over and over because sometimes your ego can kind of get in the way. I learned this lesson a few years ago when I was down in Atlanta, Georgia. I had to give an address, not dissimilar to this one, at a conference uh, in Georgia, and I was feeling pretty good about myself. My ego was walking into the door before I, before I arrived, uh, and I was feeling rather exceptional. As I'm wont to do whenever I'm in Atlanta, 
I went off and visited Dr. King's old church. And as I went in there, I sat in the pews and I looked at the podium that he used to command. There was a loop tape that was playing and his oceanic voice swept over the room. He who is greatest among you shall be a servant. Everybody can be great because everybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You don't have to know Einstein's theory of relativity to serve. You don't have to know the second theory of thermonuclear dynamics to serve. All you need is a heart full of grace and a soul that's generated by love. You can be that servant. My ego was put in check. Yes, you can be that servant. Service begins with the recognition of the greatness of others and the desire to lift it up. Look at the student that's sitting next to you. Exalt in their greatness. Forget your accomplishments for a moment. Think about what's been sacrificed by others to get you to this moment. There's an exceptionalism in those who washed floors to pay for your brilliance. Be present in that goodness. Revel in that greatness. Elevate it. Celebrate it. Be in the service of it, and your own brilliance will shine on through. You can be that servant. Here, I'm reminded of the hymn by the great Indian poet Tagore. I slept and dreamt that life was joy. I awoke and saw that life is service. I acted, and behold, service is joy. Take up the joy of your exceptional service, class of 2021. We await your greatness. Wow. <clears throat>